We are definitely teaching for the wrong century because the entire world, not just one country or two countries, is still teaching for a world where people follow directions. That's the number one thing. Can you follow directions and can you follow those directions quickly? I think it's really important to respect student ideas because they are the future and they have some really great ideas. We tend to dismiss them, but that's a mistake. We are teaching for the wrong century. The whole world is teaching for the wrong century, unfortunately. And that's because it's hard to break a cycle. We've been teaching that way for hundreds of years. And people think that education means sitting in a classroom, listening to a lecture, and taking a test. But in fact, that's not what it is today because people learn online today. Everybody learns from their phone. Everybody learns from YouTube videos or Khan Academy videos or um, Coursera videos or things like that. And so we need to remember that we are teaching for a century where we need everybody to be flexible and to be able to think for themselves independently and to possibly change jobs multiple times during their career. So they can't just learn for a world where they follow instructions. They have to learn for a world in the 21st century where the unexpected is what they expect and they need to know how to cope with that. Esther Walsh Siki, também conhecida por Walsh, jornalista desde os 14 anos, uma referência na educação. Professora de jornalismo em inglês desde 1984 em Silicon Valley. Fundou o Media Art Center na Palo Alto High School. Começou um programa de jornalismo que se tornou no maior dos Estados Unidos. É vice-presidente do Conselho Consultivo da Creative Commons. Ajudou a desenhar os programas de educação da Google. Foi distinguida com vários prémios. Recebeu o Gold Key Award pela Columbia University Scholastic Press. Publicou livros, escreve para o Huffington Post. Viaja pelo mundo a defender as suas teorias. So, first of all, I want to talk about learning a second language. I think it's great for all children to learn a second language, maybe even a third language. Children are language geniuses from the age of birth until 10. And they can just play in different groups. They can meet kids from speaking other languages. They can watch videos in different languages. Parents can speak to them in one language, uh, grandparents in a different language. They learn it without having to go to school. Yes, it's great for them to learn other languages, even though we're going to have translation devices. It, it's great for their brain. People need to understand it's their neurons in their brains that are developing when they learn another language. We all get information from our devices. And um, YouTube is the most popular website out there for information. That doesn't mean we don't need to go to college. We do definitely still need to go to college. We need to go to a place, maybe you don't want to call it college, where we interact with other people, where we learn to interact with other people. High school is going to change. That is, the traditional high school hopefully will change so that there's more reliance on using online video to teach kids and then have them collaborate with what they learned about online. But in college, colleges are going to have to change too because nobody likes sitting in a lecture listening to information that they already know. And so college will be different. College will be an opportunity to interact with, each, with other people. So people still need college. Maybe it's not called college, but it is the same college environment for four years because people grow up during those years. They make friendships. They learn how to get along. They learn how to resolve conflict. So one of the problems that happens in industry, everyone knows, companies don't fail because they have a bad idea. They usually fail because they can't get along with each other. And so college is an important training ground for how to get along with each other. That cannot be replicated on a computer. The system has to change. The system has to give students more control of their learning. It has to be more engaging for students. It can't just be lecture, 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 test, test, test. In order to be a good critical thinker, 
you have to practice. You can't just read about it, and you can't watch somebody else do it. And the same thing with creativity. I can't read an essay on creativity and then expect to be creative. It's the same thing like, how would it be if I read an essay on how to ride a bike? Then can I just hop on the bike and ride it? Or how about swimming? Or, you know, horseback riding? You know, you can't watch someone else do it and then expect to do it. Esther Wash Siki é professora na Palo Alto High School. Disseram-lhe como ensinar, deram-lhe ordens, sentar os alunos em filas. O professor fala, os alunos ouvem, dá-lhes um livro, obrigá-los a decorar a matéria, fazer testes à sexta-feira. O que decidiu na altura era considerado heresia. Livrou-se dos livros, rejeitou o currículo, libertou os alunos, deu-lhes parte do controlo sobre a sua aprendizagem. O Estado da Califórnia atribuiu-lhe uma bolsa em 1985. Comprou vários Macintosh. Foi pioneira na utilização de computadores na sala de aula, no modelo 1 para 1. Foi pioneira na aprendizagem blended e na integração da tecnologia na educação. Começou um programa de jornalismo. Well, in the beginning, I had a really hard time because I realized that students weren't motivated to sit there and listen to me for an hour. And that, uh, that I could see that learning did not take place that way. And that it only took place when they interacted with each other. The problem was that the system did not support me. So I had, um, I had problems with the administration because they wanted to know why my students were talking to each other and why they just weren't sitting there listening to me talk all the time. And I couldn't tell them the truth because, you know, I didn't have tenure. So they gave me uh, two weeks to get what they called, get your classes in shape. Make those kids sit there and listen to you all the time. And I was like, oh my God, um, was very um, upsetting. But then I figured out a solution. And the solution was that um, I told my students what was happening to me and that, you know, if the next time the supervisor came in, the principal came in to class and they weren't absolutely silent and looking at their book, that I was going to get into trouble. So the next time the principal came in, the class looked around, they saw, and they're like, quiet, they didn't, they were perfect. And so from then on, it was like a signal, you know, that they would just be quiet and I passed the test. <laughs> then they're like, they quit the administration, they were like, how did you get them to be so well behaved now? <laughs> Not telling you the secret. <laughs> Esther Wash Siki fundou o Media Arts Center. O seu programa de jornalismo tornou-se no maior dos Estados Unidos e é reconhecido como o melhor do país. Começou sozinha com 19 alunos. Hoje conta com cerca de 700 e mais 7 professores. Começou numa instalação portátil. Hoje o centro tem mais de 25 mil metros quadrados. Começou por um jornal de 6 páginas. Hoje gera 10 publicações regulares e premiadas e cria conteúdos para diferentes canais. Impactou a vida de milhares de alunos. Muitos deles estenderam este impacto a novas áreas. Criou a iniciativa Moonshots, baseada na sua filosofia. Hoje está a levar este conceito a docentes por todo o mundo, para que as crianças atinjam o seu potencial máximo e os professores também. Se começássemos do zero, como seriam as salas de aula? I think the secret is collaborating with students and giving them some control of their learning uh, le and letting them direct the program because a lot of the changes that have been made to the program that made it better came from students. They made the suggestions and I said, oh, sounds like a good idea, so we went with it. It's different for every single country and every single community. What works in Palo Alto, California is not necessarily 
going to be what works in France or in Portugal or in Italy. But the concept will work. The idea of giving students time to work on something that is important to them that relates to the community. There's so many ways that we can improve the world. And giving students that opportunity to think about it, my God, what a gift that would be to everybody, to the student, to the community, to the administration, everybody. And then they are engaged, they learn what they should be learning in class, and they get to practice it. So that learning becomes embedded in their mind, not just something that they memorized. So in this, my advice to Portuguese teachers is, no matter what your subject is, whether it's math, science, history, literature, art, whatever, make sure that you have some kind of project that the students can work on together because that's where you learn the communication skills and the collaboration skills. You don't have to come up with the project. That's what teachers think, I have to come up with the project. No, you give the kids an opportunity to come up with their own project and let them pick their groups, groups of four students or so, and let them work on that project 20% of the time. So that's why I'm pushing this 20% time. 80% of the time, you can continue to teach in the traditional method. 20% of the time, let them take whatever it is they're learning in your class and apply it to a project that they're working with in a group. O ser humano constrói-se como uma árvore nas suas raízes. As suas raízes é o pré-escolar e o primeiro ciclo. O espaço saladal ou o espaço escola tem de ser para além dos muros físicos e psicológicos. Edgar Borges percorreu escolas de norte a sul do país. Há 10 anos que ensina em albergaria à velha. Acredita que a sala de aula não é uma zona de conforto. A aprendizagem envolve todos, alunos, pais, professores, comunidade. Não nos devemos agarrar a manuais, mas sim motivar os alunos a aprender e deixá-los gerir esta jornada. De uma plataforma de programação, nasceu um desafio. Mais de 200 alunos construíram robôs recicláveis. A iniciativa estendeu-se a toda a comunidade e até as famílias se juntaram ao projeto. Da escola nasceu um estúdio. Bom dia. Desde empresários à autarquia, todos se envolveram e valorizaram a sua componente artística. Mais do que o equipamento, mais do que o investimento, o fator emocional uniu a comunidade à volta do canal web. Edgar acredita que cada aluno é um projeto de vida, que avança e recua num ritmo próprio. E que cada professor é um influencer, que acima de tudo, tem de ser um aluno. Todas as escolas de albergaria se juntam. Alunos, professores e famílias desenvolvem um projeto que no final do ano culmina numa mostra. Alunos do terceiro ano propõem jogos. Alunos do quarto apresentam projetos rentáveis. Alunos do secundário trazem planos de negócio. Projetos que já correram Portugal e outros países e foram apresentados a empresas. O futuro do professor é um futuro muito exigente. É um futuro que exige ao professor constantemente aprender. A escola do futuro não pode ser escola professor-aluno. 
Não pode. Isso acho que é categórico. A escola do futuro é a escola de todos. E outra coisa, a pessoa não pode esperar pelo governo central. Não pode, não deve. A pessoa tem de ter em ação, tem que bater. Porque a escola onde eu estou não é uma escola modelo. Temos as pessoas como modelo. Well, the jobs that are disappearing are the jobs nobody really wants to do. Those are usually the automated jobs, the jobs that um, are factory worker jobs. So if you want your child to have a good job for the 21st century, then you have to let them learn a lot of these skills I talk about, the collaboration, creativity, critical thinking, and Uh, communication skills. Those are the most important skills, and they need to learn those in class and also at home. And I would say that it's in the 21st century, these skills are probably the most important skills that you can have your children learn. In a world of exponential technology, we want to have exponential education so that kids can actually take advantage of the exponential world. Um, we need an education system that's going to change now, not in 10 years, but now. We've been giving it so much time to change. Literally, it's been going on for at least 30 years. Since 1990, you know, people have been saying we're gonna change education with technology. And it's been so resistant to change. And that's because There's fear of failure in the schools. So they were like, I'm not going to change at all because then I don't have to worry about failing because I'm just the same as I've always been. Yes, the whole system's failing because you refuse to change. You need to change. Everybody needs to change. He is right. That's why we need to change the way we teach to encourage kids to try new things and to make mistakes. That's why my students, they're never graded on an essay until the essay is publishable. So if we can't publish it, then you're going to revise it. And when it's published, you get an A, automatic A. So you don't worry about the grade. You only worry about making sure that whatever it is you're writing is good quality. And then nobody gets upset because it's called an edit. We edit the work. All editors edit the work. It's, we're not targeting any one student. Sometimes some students have to edit things three, four, five times. Other students just two times maybe, one time. Doesn't matter. How many times it takes you to get to perfection doesn't matter. The fact is that you got there. So my three daughters are very successful, and I'm happy to say that as a mother. And um, I don't want to take full credit for their wonderful success, but I do think that every mother is really responsible, father as well. And I think that the first five years are the most important. And so I feel that I did a lot of right things when they were very small. And by the time your child is five years old, They already have a lot of habits, and they copy your habits. So what you try should be trying to do is to model good behavior. The behavior that they exhibit is actually a copy of your behavior. And so fortunately, I guess I was pretty well behaved when they were little, 
because they all seem to have learned quite a bit. And I spent a lot of time with them and a lot of time teaching them what I considered important skills for life. And I'm happy that they're so successful. Well, I would like to imagine a world where kids coming from the developing world are educated and can make important changes in their lives and in the lives of their community. Those kids have great ideas. And if you give them an opportunity to exercise their ideas, it can improve the world. If you just look at all the changes that have happened in the world today, they all came from young people. They're, these are people that were in their 20s, their early 20s, where they discovered things like that. And I mean, you just look at Google and Facebook and Twitter. The people that created those products were all young people. And give them an opportunity to do that. Also, the people that created those products were rebels. They were not the straight-A students. They were the ones who said, I want to do this for the world. And they weren't concentrated on getting a good grade. They were concentrating on their project, what it was that made them happy. I mean, just think about Mark Zuckerberg. He just, he created that product because he wanted people to meet each other. He wanted to meet people and he didn't have another, a way to do it. And he wasn't saying, oh, I want to create a billion, I want to make a billion dollars. He was doing something because he cared about the idea. And Peter Diamantes, he says, do you want to make a billion dollars? Think of a billion ways to help people. That makes a difference. <laughs> Thank you.